Hey, I know I should be watching baseball, and I will be shortly, just after you guys take in this awesome stuff that Michael Irvin said about the Texans. And uh, I know that some of you might feel a certain way, Texans fans, about Michael Irvin. Uh, I I once I once felt a little bit similarly. Then uh, we used to have him on the show, and he was awesome. So he's got a YouTube channel, and I think it's relatively new because for a very brief moment in time, I think I have more uh, I have more uh, YouTube subscribers than he does. So. Let's rejoice in this moment. But he did say some really good things about the Texans. This would have been after the Diggs trade, but before the uh, the, the renegotiation was disclosed. So I don't know how he felt about that. But um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, Seth Payne from Payne and Pendergast. Former Houston Texan. Long, 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 long time ago. So as Rick Hagwood says, uh, I saw this post and sent him a request to talk to Diggs. He's spot on with his thoughts. So Michael Irvin on his I, I seemingly new YouTube channel, just fired off like a five minute, 10 minute video after the trade. And I, the, one of the very first things he did, which I was super stoked about, was that uh, he, he invoked a, a tender memory in the minds of a lot of us Texans fans. Let's, uh, let's have a listen. The statement I made there, I want to. Okay, so this is when, okay, hold on. Let me go back. Let me let me back this up. He brings up the DeAndre Hopkins trade, and he says, "Yeah, remember back when I broke this story about the DeAndre Hopkins trade, which was it was him. He disclosed, uh, or excuse me, not the trade. He disclosed that DeAndre Hopkins had had some bad blood and some words with Bill O'Brien. Supposedly, Bill O'Brien had said that there are certain parts of the way DeAndre was behaving that reminded him of Aaron Hernandez, and uh, DeAndre tried to, to to squelch it. But anyway, let's let's relive that magical moment." The statement I made there, I want to bring forward here because it blows my mind how karma works. Back in 2020, they traded DeAndre Hopkins. I called it for a ham sandwich. And I'm saying somehow, some way, they just got back a top receiver for a ham sandwich. That's what blows my mind. Okay, so, uh, yes. The DeAndre Hopkins trade, uh, I would say DeAndre was a little bit younger uh, than Stefan Diggs at that time. Um, the other thing that was was different about the DeAndre Hopkins trade was just that it, it wasn't the trend at that moment. Stefan Diggs himself got traded to Buffalo uh, that very, very, very uh, close in time to the DeAndre Hopkins trade for a lot more compensation. So I, I don't know if it's apples to apples. I'm glad he didn't bring up the Ed Reed trade. I'm sure he doesn't remember that. But Michael Irvin had actually broken that news about the conversation be, between DeAndre Hopkins and Bill O'Brien. I think it is notable, and this all does come back to D'Amico in some ways. I think it's notable that Bill O'Brien, in DeAndre Hopkins' words, had never really developed a relationship with DeAndre Hopkins. I don't know if Bill O'Brien was the right guy to either maybe listen to or work with DeAndre, but those two just never connected. They were like water and oil, apparently. I think that the D'Amico side of things, I'll, I'll bring up the, I'll bring up the comparison that, that that I've been tooling around with in my head when it comes to D'Amico and Stefan Diggs. This is Michael Irvin expressing great joy about what the Texans have done this offseason. I love what the Texans are doing. They got all that young, great talent. And now they are sprinkling in a few dog old head, old head dogs. Man, Joe Mixon is an old head dog, a fighter. He's a veteran at Teacher Rose. He's a good dude to have in your locker room. And he's a real dog, a fighter. Stefan Diggs is cut from that same cloth. And you put them in a locker room with D'Amico Ryan because they're going to want to have success. They're going to want to help him with his success. You got something working. And they are going to be in the top of the AFC. There you go. From Michael Wir Michael Irvin's mouth to God's ears. Uh, a couple things there. One, they're going to want to work for D'Amico Ryan's. I, the... The thing that I keep thinking about is Travis Kelsey with Andy Reid. I mean, Travis Kelsey damn near assaulted Andy Reid on the sideline during the Super Bowl. Travis Kelsey was a pain in the ass his first couple of years, much more so 
Like Travis Kelsey was way more immature and irresponsible than Stefan Diggs. They're different people, uh, but they've got they've got the, some drama that comes along with them at times. And I think Andy Reid is just the the perfect persona for some of the more fiery guys who catch footballs. And I think D'Amico is that same way. I mean, D'Amico not the not the same personality as Andy Reid, but I think he's got that ability to to set aside the BS. And a lot of times, like what one of Stefan Diggs' fellow wide receivers in Buffalo said once was like, hey, you know, sometimes sometimes Stefan Diggs just needs to be heard. You know, sometimes he just wants to be sure that the that his voice is being heard. And I think D'Amico, I think CJ Stroud, I think the other receivers in that room are going to be just fine with that, especially because it's on a, a one-year deal. As far as the old heads, the the old dogs, a couple things about that. One, this is the right time to be doing it. Like you're still trying to install a culture here. It, I mean CJ and Will Anderson are far above and beyond like in the leadership department than almost anybody I've ever seen before. It's crazy. Um, but like Joe Mixon's been a captain for three years. Stefan Diggs was a captain. We talk about working hard or being a dog or what all that, you know, Cole Beasley said that Stefan Diggs will work. Like he wanted to really emphasize like this guy works. I don't think anybody's ever questioned his work ethic really in, 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 in Minnesota, there was the contract dispute in Buffalo. Things got ugly. And, Josh Allen said that there had been some issue after the Bengals playoff game in 2022, but it was all squashed. Stefan Diggs made very little of it, and yet we continue to have these things. Uh, Colin Coward said that he'd heard last year that Josh Allen had an issue with Stefan Diggs. Stephen A. said that he's been hearing that, that Stefan Diggs wanted out. I guess he reported that sometime during the fall. And all the things that they're reporting in Buffalo, it's funny. Uh, they, it's, it's not like there's any new revelations or anything. A lot of this was already known that there was just, there were all these little miniature rifts here and there or a little bit moments of drama and whatever. He was he was A-OK -okay for the first couple of years, got himself a $104 million contract, then was within a year was agitating about uh, everything. But it's not our concern, not our concern. Last thing about, this, and this is specifically about that. This is Michael Irvin with some specific advice for Stefan Diggs. I want to talk also right now to my dude, because he is my dude and I love him, Stefan Diggs. This one got to work, bro. This one got to work. This one, right here, right now, you got to get one of them. You see them things up there? You, the thing didn't work with the quarterback in Minnesota, Kirk Cousins. Didn't work with the quarterback in Buffalo, Josh Allen. It has to work here. It has to work here. That's what my bishop always said. If I had an issue with a relationship here, issue with a relationship, issue, stop checking the relationships and look at you. Let's just make sure that stuff on that this one works and you bring home one of them. As the old uh, second divorce advice, it's like before you head into your third marriage, if you've been divorced twice, and I say that with plenty of people in my uh, in my family, or at least uh, in, and also close relations that have had multiple marriages. Yeah, you got to start looking inwardly. This is Brandon Cook's third team now, and he's he's forced his way off, or it's been acrimonious in two of them. It's and, and I think a picture emerges of, just like a lot of old-school diva wide receivers, I think sometimes, you know, go back to Shockey with the Giants as a tight end, uh, sometimes they're just so damn competitive and fiery, and it comes out in the worst ways and moments. Again, it's a one-year contract. I think that it's going to be just fine. I'm not worried about I'm not worried about outbursts or anything. The the one interesting thing is I was watching the Cover One podcast, which is a bunch of guys up in Buffalo. And they actually watch film and everything. We uh, because they were talking about the fact that his production dropped off after in the second last third of the season last year after he'd been on pace for like 1,600 yards, and a lot of it coincided with when things started getting really dramatic. It's not like he wasn't open. I do think that Joe Brady, the offensive coordinator who replaced Ken Dorsey, may have really just been making a contrived, uh, a, a very conscious effort to spread the ball around. And whether it was to prove they could do it without Stefan Diggs or what have you, um, I, there was there was a lot more to it than just football. Like I don't think that Stefan Diggs all of a sudden in November of last year fell off a cliff physically.
You know, like that. There's another couple of years for that to happen, especially with a smaller wide receiver. So I'm not worried about that at all. I think he'll be using the slot a bunch like he was last year. He's still like he's nasty with a lot of his his cuts and his route running, especially in shorter area stuff. And if if everybody's backed up a little bit because they're worried about Tank Dell and Nico Collins, he can do some really good stuff in the slot. The only thing that concerns me right now is just how many targets are there to go around and and whether or not that'll be an issue for either Nico, who's getting his contract potentially, or Stefan Diggs, who's you know also wanting to get a contract. I don't know. Uh, the other part of Michael Urban's advice, which was talking about Kirk Cousins and Josh Allen, he left out one Case Keenum. So Case, as far as we can tell, is super stoked to have uh, to have Stefan Diggs back in the fold. And and I like again, there's so many colorful personalities on the team. I played with I played with a couple guys like in 10 years in the NFL, there were at least a couple guys that probably got cut simply because they were a pain, pain in the ass. And it's it's always a balance between how good are you as a football player and really how big of a pain in the ass are you? And and who are you a pain in the ass to? So if you're a pain in the ass to the head coach all the time, that that depends on the head coach. If you're a pain in the ass to your quarterback or if your quarterback doesn't like you or whatever the situation was up in Buffalo, then it's going to be an acrimonious end for that. I'm going to take some questions, and then i got to watch this Astros game. And also, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm Seth Payne. Uh, played 10 years in the NFL, five years with the Texans. The very first, The very first five years of the Texans which as anybody would tell you is probably the most glorious, uh, just uh, draped in glory years of the Houston Texans. Don't, don't, don't check that. Just we'll be fine. Let's see. I don't think the locker room will let anyone be an ass. Just won't happen. I agree with you retired row. And it was nice meeting you before the game. I can't remember which game it was. You had a nice, ch nice chat. You chided me for some of my negativity during the Easterby years, but now we're on the same page. I spend, so much less time listening to like mental health podcasts or trying out like the new Andy Huberman protocol or whatever it is. My mental health is so much better now without, without all this nonsense floating around. Do you think we picked up digs for this year to keep Nico from having a 13 or 15? Oh God, no. Uh, that would be a messed up thing to do, Jake. I like your diabolical thinking. I feel like maybe you're watching too much Survivor or something. This, I'll tell you, I'm not, I'm not saying that some teams wouldn't do that. The thing is that Nico, as long as he, no matter what his numbers are, if he plays to the same level that he did last year, he's going to get paid really big, especially if he goes to free agency. So um, I do like that. I, I like your diabolical Machiavellian thinking, but I don't think that they would do that. That's not just me being naive. There's probably, there's probably only like four or five general managers in the league that are actively trying to screw their own players. Issue after, oh, I'll have to look that up. I forgot about that. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. Gennaro, I don't know if that's a wow to Michael Irvin or if that's because you're um, you're doing the Korean wow from the hit Netflix reality show Physical 100 where I learned the Korean word for wow is wow. It's spelled U-W-A. I wonder if anyone ever mouthed off to D'Amico. He seems so chill but was still an NFL linebacker. Yeah, I, that's a You know what? I don't think anybody's ever pulled like a whatever happened with Justin Reed and David Culley. I don't think I don't think you have to worry about that. And if it did, like you know, like it's not, it's not like Nico's gonna fight him or anything. It's just there's a he commands respect. And he is, I'll tell you this, is like I'm not nearly as big as I used to be, but I'm still a big guy. I'm like six foot four. I was reading somebody today who's talking about she was on a flight from Dallas to LA and she was getting a lot of guff for wearing her Astros gear. And I gotta tell you, I've worn I've worn like orange Astros gear all over airports and towns, large and small in America. And uh, very, very rarely does anybody say anything in other than except like the most uh, kind of like obviously having fun and joking way. So uh, the, the physical, the physical size still seems to help. I, it's messed up. I never, I'm always taken aback. I'm not, it's not, it's not like I'm trying to bully anybody. I don't know if I could bully anybody anymore. I got a double hernia as we speak. And I've got heartburn for the first time in my life. Which is just exactly like, yeah, that is good advice from Irving, um, especially the part about relationships. So for those of you who missed it, Michael Irving told Stefan Diggs just that, A, you got to win one of these. And then he pointed up to his three Lombardi trophies. 
I've, I've got a picture of us breaking a huddle. No Lombardi trophies. But, uh, and then he also said that you got to make it work this time. You've been in multiple relationships with multiple quarterbacks. And just like anybody that has multiple broken off relationships, be sure that you'll look at yourself and, and figure it out. Maybe we can trade pick 42, 2025 first and six. And say, yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Another mini stroke, Seth. Did I say Brandon Cooks? Oh, God. How many times did I say it? How many times did I say it? I said for everybody, I, was, I did this during the show on Friday. I said Brandon Cooks in place of Stefan Diggs so many times. And that's not the right guy to be swapping out. You know, Brandon Cooks has the NFL record for times being traded. He's tied with Eric Dickerson. So there's like there's some similarities there. They reeled in Josh a little too. Yeah, thank you, buy stocks. Um, and I know if there's any Buffalonians here, that is something that I know just because I'm I'm up I'm from Rochester, New York originally. It's like an hour and a half east of Buffalo. And I <laughs> I don't know how to say this as a media member other than that there was widespread speculation amongst the fan base and lots of people about just like what the hell is going with going on with Josh Allen. And, and, and this, again, that's why you can't really know with any kind of certainty what the drama was within the locker room. He said, she said, whose fault was it? It just feels like it got really ugly and or maybe not even really ugly. Maybe it was more kind of like James Harden and Dwight Howard where it was, um, Oh, the, at the time, the writer for The Athletic had called it like just civilly, basically just disliking each other, but in a civil way. Once Diggs sees the other wide receivers will actually block from after the catch, he'll feel the band of brothers thing here. Very good attitudes about blocking these guys. I was watching a, I was watching a Stefan Diggs 2021 best 100 players, and two things were weird, or two things were notable pertaining to that comment one was that they were playing in empty stadiums and it was like I had just completely forgotten that they played an entire season largely in front of empty stadiums so from the 2020s the 2021 best player was using highlights from 2020 uh but then the other was Stefan Diggs had said that his favorite play of the last year was when he had he had blocked somebody at the goal line I can't remember who had, uh, who had cleared the path for to score. Um, but, you know, he's he's aware of that, and I think he buys in. He's probably going to be playing a lot of slot this year. Probably hard to act up around all those guys. Yeah, and even, you know, the thing is, like, even if he does act up, I think that, like, so much comes down to just having the conversation. Football teams, this might surprise you, but... Uh, these organizations that are run by like hyper competitive alpha males with a boatload of testosterone, uh, they don't always communicate all that well. They don't like sit down and talk out their feelings. So it's really like the coaches who can do it. I cannot tell you what an extreme advantage they have, like that they can actually communicate or say, Hey, I've got an issue with the way you're behaving because it doesn't line up with our common goals. I like you. You like me. I am uh, maybe. I don't know. But we've got a common goal, and this is how we need to operate versus, you know, MFing people and everything. So I like D'Amico. D'Amico's good in that regard. D'Amico has the people. He's got the he's got the people skills. Haven't watched it yet. Need to get to it. So uh I added Michael Irvin's. Yes. I added Michael Irvin's YouTube link down below. If you could, three outs in the first inning. Okay, good. Good, good, good. I didn't. It's not Hunter Brown throwing fastball after fastball this evening. All right, last last question from Brady or comment. Maybe there's some truth to bleep at digs there somewhere mentality, which led to too many turnovers and limiting digs later last season. Um, yeah, I, I the, it was ugly, man. I mean, the Kansas City game, especially. I know it was cold, but there were times where you know Josh Allen improved his accuracy a lot. But there were also throughout the season, just when I was watching Bill's games, and it's not like I watched a boatload of them, there were overthrows. You know, still, he didn't all of a sudden fix his mechanics and turn into a pinpoint downfield thrower. He can, he can do some incredible things on a football field. But there's probably things where I could see a receiver gets frustrated. Um, you know, CJ, obviously, different type of quarterback. 
than Josh Allen. Not he's not going to be nearly ever the running threat that that Josh is. And but the accuracy is going to be something that I think Stefan Diggs really likes. All right, one more. I lied. Diggs was by far number one. His attitude mattered. I think we have three number ones now. If all stay healthy, Diggs antics will get him cut quicker than break down team chemistry. Yeah, and I think that's a little bit of the Patriots way that I'm cool with. You know, like when we used to have arguments all the time about whether or not Nick was going to be too much about the Patriots way. I think that he's been very much his own guy in some respects. Oh, uh, Jordan Pun, who blogs about the Texans a lot or does videos. Uh, he had pointed out that, as, as many of you also have, but that Nick Casario, the entire time he's been here, has only drafted one non-Power 5 player in the draft, and it was Tank Dell, whose team is, of course, now in a Power 5 conference. So straddling the edge a little bit there. And I, and I was thinking, man, yeah, the Patriots have drafted quite a few guys from non-Power 5 conferences. You go back and look at the Patriots' draft history, and there's times where like their top two picks – in a draft are both from non-Power 5 conferences. There's a, there's a Chattanooga. There's some hyphenated school that I've never heard of before. Whereas Nick, Nick is all about getting guys from big schools that have played in big games. And I'm cool with that. I think, yeah, obviously, it was okay with the Patriots the way they did it. But I do wonder, there, there always used to be these stories that, you know, in the last decade or so, Belichick would, would kind of debo his scouting staff. And, and, and they might have a certain consensus about players. Of course, these are all rumors or what have you. Um, and But then Belichick would basically say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what we want. And I wonder if Nick was not on board with that, you know, not insubordinate about it or anything, but he certainly has operated differently here. Relatively small sample size because Bill O'Brien didn't leave many picks. But still, I think it's something notable, something to pay attention to this year. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you again. Seth Payne, please like, subscribe. I played for the Texans a long, long, long time ago when D'Amico Ryans <coughs> was a rookie. About the second week of training camp, they decided to make him the starter. And I was a grizzled old, miserable, uh, much fatter than I am now uh, in that heat, just angry veteran. And I didn't like, I didn't like a rookie being elevated as quickly as he was. And uh, so one day, the first day that D'Amico was playing linebacker as a starter, he was having trouble spitting the play call out and and like the offense was coming up to the line it was a goal line period i think it was a live goal line period and i and i basically used some choice language to tell him to spit the bleep and call out and D'Amico looked at me and it was like he was the beast master i uh he, he just he compiled he, he he calmed me down completely it was one of the weirdest things that's ever happened it was from that moment that i was like okay this there's something different about this kid then he went on to be defensive rookie of the year and had a great career and now he's probably going to like 17 super bowls whatever all right yeah like subscribe tell a friend i'll see you guys tomorrow this i think this is three days in a row a model of consistency